You're listening to The Business Marketing Show, episode number 73. You can find us at businessmarketingshow.com on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Hi, everyone. This is Ed K. Smith from The Business Marketing Show here with my co-host Brendan Tully and we have a special guest on the show today, Mr. Tony Nash, the founder and CEO of booktopia.com.au. So uh, Tony and I have had some chats about some some business related stuff when we got in contact over LinkedIn and I thought seeing as it's the, the largest bookseller in Australia and uh, a lot of that is happening through e- e-commerce mainly or purely, then we should really have a conversation because a lot of our listeners are in the uh, the e-commerce space and looking at marketing products online. So who better to have on than someone like Tony? So thank you very much for coming on the show, Tony. How are you? Pretty good and pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking the time out of your no doubt very hectic schedule. So, So Tony, this is a really big subject at the moment. It's being talked about a lot. Stuff to do with e-commerce is constantly in the news, uh, in particular with uh, things like you know, companies like Amazon coming into Australia and interrupting things in a major way. And so before we get into all that sort of stuff, uh, you obviously had a history before you got involved with selling books online and, and, and starting Booktopia. So let's Let's do a bit of a, a regress back to the early days of young Tony. And where, where did you uh, grow up? Where, where did you spend your youth, Tony? I grew up in Sydney. Uh-huh. I was um, on the lower north shore of Sydney, and I um, wasn't a particularly good student. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was pretty average, and uh, I scraped into university um, with, a, with a mark if you were to put it in today's terms, at 56% out of 100. <laughs> so not, not particularly high. And I, I ended up mastering in Space Invaders and Snooker and failed in accounting and economics. So after six months, I had dropped out of uni and became the mail boy at the NRMA, an insurance company mm-hmm. here in, in Australia. And and I was like that guy in the movies from the 80s where they roll around with, the, with all the, the mail and you drop them off at people's desks. That was my job. Yeah, there was a Michael J. Fox movie where he was doing that. Um, that, was, that was me. Yeah, yeah, I forgot the name of the movie, but yeah, that was a good movie. Um, and uh, he had an affair with the boss's secretary, so I don't know whether he did that, mate. But <laughs> we'll, we'll just keep that. We'll keep that. Uh, what happened in the mailroom stays in the mailroom. And uh, so that was. I mean, that sounds like a typical entrepreneurial start. <laughs> so, so many business. Uh, people had those sorts of, you know, very, very sort of similar, you know, dropped out of uni, not a good student. It's all, it all almost sounds cliche these days, but um, it, it sounds like me as well. I was sort of a bit like you uh, in that scenario. So you then working in this mailroom at the at the insurance company, uh, what happened from that point? What got you out of the mailroom? So, um, yeah, so what happened, there was this company called the Control Data Institute that – advertised uh, a six-month programming course. And if you did it, then you would qualify to become a programmer. Now, this is at a time where people were going to uni for three years to do to do programming. So it was, it was supposed to be like a, a fast way of pushing you through and getting you qualified. So I did that, but I, I stretched it out to 21 months instead of six months by playing four competitive sports at the same time. <laughs> and so I, I was... Um, I was very much uh, distracted, but eventually I, I finished and I became a, a COBOL programmer and actually got a job working on an island in the middle of Sydney Harbour that built that built uh, ships and submarines and it was called the uh, Cockatoo Dockyards, Cockatoo oh, yeah. Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a I was a COBOL programmer, so in those days they had ICL mainframes and we would sit in our programming room on sheets of paper writing out the code and then run down the hill and give it to the ladies who would then uh, data enter it into the system and compile it and run it and tell us how many errors we made and then I would have to go back and make my changes and my errors so 
you couldn't just sit there and compile your program like you do today and everything happens so quickly. It was a very long and slow process. So I, after doing that for a year and a half, I, I, I was not a very good programmer. I wanted to get into sales, and, and so I became a, a computer salesman. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then after doing that for about a year and a half, I decided I, at the age of 23 I wanted to travel around the world. So I told my family I'm going away for three years. I was away for three and a half, and while I was, after traveling through Europe for nine months, I ended up in London, and I wanted to get a job as a as a, a COBOL programming contractor. And I walked into the recruitment agency, and they said, instead of uh, instead of selling computers as you've been doing for the last year or so, why don't you why don't you sell people? Why don't you become a recruitment consultant? So I did that, and <laughs> and I took to that took to that like a duck to water. I was I was very good at it because I I, I like sales and. And uh, the the product that I was selling was completely intangible. Uh, there was there were every every product was unique, and and it was people dealing with people. Which I was a people person, and and I did recruitment for the IT industry for fourteen years after that. Wow! So when what was that? What year did you start uh, doing the recruitment work in in London? Nineteen at uh, the end of nineteen eighty seven, beginning of nineteen eighty eight. Okay. All right. No worries. So. And then 14 years, were you based in London that whole time or did you come back to Australia? Yeah, so after two years, I, um, I got selected in England to go on a scientific adventure expedition to the south of Chile, which I did for three months. And then I lived in Santiago teaching English for, for a, few, a few months. And then I traveled around South America, North America, and then came home. And I, I joined a company called Computer Power um, yeah. in Australia and yeah. And was a recruitment consultant for them for about five years, and then I set my set my own recruitment agency up in the front room of my house in nineteen in the mid nineties. So um, I got my IT guy to come around on the first day to set up the the computer, and he went home that evening after it was all set up, and I turned it on, and I saw there was a thing called a browser, mm. and so I clicked on it, <laughs> and I, I did a search for jobs in Australia, and up came a website that did um, IT jobs, IT recruitment website, and so I called them, and I said, what's the deal? And they said, it's it's $100 a week to advertise your jobs, and I said, per job, and they said, no, as many jobs as you want. Now, oh. back in the mid-90s yeah. in Australia, uh, Rupert Murdoch Rupert Murdoch owned the Australian, and, um, and 64 pages of IT um, IT pages on a Tuesday was about 60 pages of ads, yeah. which he made a ton of money. And our company, Computer Power, was probably spending about $10,000 a week. So back then, spending $100 a week on this thing called the internet, I thought that fitted right into my budget because I started, started my company with nothing. And uh, and so that night, I put my eight jobs up onto the website, which I had carried over from my previous clients who were loyal to me. And the next morning, I turned on my computer and I saw there was a there were some emails coming through, and I and I, I looked at that those emails and I said, that's the future of recruitment. And from day one, I went out and told people I was an internet recruitment agency. And and um, I started actually two years before even Seek.com.au started. I was a third recruitment agency on Seek. So in, when I would go out and tell people I'm an internet recruitment agency, the first question I got asked was, what's the internet? What's the internet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, had, uh, I've been involved in the internet now for over 20 years. Yeah, an old sea dog like me. Well, not Brendan. Brendan's a young pup, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I've I've sort of been in the game that sort of amount of time too. But it sounds like you've got a book you're going to be writing yourself as well, Tony. And let alone selling them. There's all the different things you've done. It sounds like a very interesting story. I'm I'm sure you've got lots to uh, to put down for posterity sake. Posterity sake. Yeah. So, so so what happened was that was. Uh... But that was the first company I had. And then after a couple of years, I convinced my brother and my sister and my brother-in-law to join me. And together, we built that company up to about 35 people. Mm-hmm. And because my brother-in-law's background was an IBM software engineer, he and I, uh, with my programming background and IT um, um, mindset, I guess, um, and his skills, we started building all this software for our recruitment business. And uh, we ended up with this chat software um a piece of chat software that enabled us and our consultants to chat with a candidate while they were still sitting at their desk in a secure, secure and encrypted chat session. And, um, and, and when we were being toured around the country by IBM, who saw what we had done with their software, people came up to us and they said, oh, that's, that's interesting. Can we buy your product? And we said, it's not a product. It's a piece of software. Well, can you turn it into a product? And so we did. And so we ended up with two businesses. We had this 
recruitment company and then we had a chat software business and the and the chat software business we, we were selling our we were selling a you know a per seat um, number of people you have in your organization. Uh, well, I, they could chat with their with their customers, and there was a lot of online online stores that were using it. We even had it in a credit union, so they could chat with their customers behind their behind their, their member login area. So this this business was growing, and we thought, well, this is where we're going to make our fortune. So we decided to sell the recruitment company to focus on the chat software. And a month after we did that, there was a huge dot com crash in the early two thousands that we got caught up in. Yeah, and uh, and uh, we the business was going to go under. We weren't making any money at all. We couldn't even pay ourselves a salary. And so we're sitting around the table thinking, oh, oh God, what are we going to do? We may have to get permanent jobs. And uh, I was talking to, around that time, a web designer, and I said to him, you know, Google has been going for a few years now. How do you get to the top of Google? Like if we were at the top of Google for chat software or live help, maybe we'd make a few more sales. And he told me what to do. And within a couple of months, we were at the top of Google for those terms. And and I was talking to this lady about getting her to use our chat software on her website. She said, look, I'd love to chat to people. I just need more people coming to my website. And I, I said to her, well, I, I can get you to the top of Google. And she said, well, give me a proposal. So I did it for $500 and I did the job and she was very happy. And and we were, we were in such dire straits at that time. We, were, we, were, we, were, we had no idea how we were going to survive. And I was talking also to the largest independent car rental company in New Zealand. And I similar conversation Um use our chat software, I need more people coming to my website, give me a proposal. So this time, input, instead of giving giving this company a proposal of $500, I gave him a proposal of $18,000. I spoke <laughs> to him for an hour, an hour on the phone about all the things we were going to do for his business and driving traffic and and improving his website. And, and after the hour, he said, all right, let's do it. And I put down the phone, I turned to my family, I said to them, Man, we're in big trouble now. We have no idea what we're doing. And- <laughs> well, there's, there's two. I think there's a couple of lessons in that. Brendan and I have to put our prices up, and uh, also, yeah, sometimes it's good to have a plan to know what the next step is. But sometimes, you, I mean, it sounds like a lot of you're just going with your uh, with your gut instinct and following your intuition and seeing where that led you. So what what happened from that point? So you've, you've offered these services, and for want of a better word, we would call them search engine optimization services for getting people ranked. Mm-hmm. Did that continue on as a business from that point on? Yeah, so what happened was we quickly morphed from this uh, failing um, internet chat software company into a surviving and then thriving SEO and internet marketing consultancy. And we we had hundreds of customers across Australia and New Zealand that we were doing all this consulting work for. And and there were other SEO companies around in those early days, but they, they had been already around for a little while and they were going for the big end of town. They were going for the banks and the insurance companies and, and so forth. And we just stuck to entrepreneurs and small to medium-sized enterprise. So, so we were doing like $2,000 projects, $3,000, $5,000 projects. Mm. And, and we just um, we were able to pay, pay ourselves a salary and we, we made our mark on the landscape back in those days. And then in 2003, my brother won a project to work on the Angus and Robertson website to get them to the top of Google. Right. And he did that successful project. And, and back in 2003, uh, Angus and Robertson outsourced the whole of their website and all of their fulfillment to a company in Sydney that, that did all of that for them. And at the end of every month, whatever they had sold, they just got a commission check and said, look, this is what we sold and this is your portion of it and thank you very much. And ah, it served them okay. well because, because back in those days, they had a lot of franchisees. And <clears throat> when you're a when you're a master franchise or um, to have your website at arm's length uh, actually served them very well. So, so if there was any kind of disgruntled franchisees, you're taking business away from me. Well, it's this other company. They're doing it. We don't know anything about that. And it was the internet. It was the early days. So they kind of got away with it. And so yeah. my brother my brother had this idea of, of approaching the company that managed their managed the Angus and Robertson website because they actually managed 80 bookstores websites and they did, were doing all of their fulfillment. So at Christmas of 2003 a meeting was set up where my brother and I went there and met with the owner owners of the company and and pitched the idea of, of them introducing us to their other 80 customers and we could get them all to the top of Google and then they'll make lots of money and and once we made that pitch the owner of the company said no nah, not interested. And I said Really, you're not interested in making more money? And he goes, "Look, it's not our, it's not our business. Our business is managing websites and fulfilling on those book orders." Mm. I said, "Well, how does it all work?" And they said, "Look, it takes 
10 minutes to set up a bookshop and then you give us the name of the store and uh, within 10 minutes you'll have a website with a million bo books on there and your name up the top. I said, wow, that sounds really interesting. And then, and then they were quick to respond and said, well, actually, no internet only business has made anything of it. It's all been off the back of a traditional bookstore that wanted a website. They're the ones that have actually kind of gone on and made something about it. And I said, oh, okay, fair enough. Anyway, so I'm driving back to to um, our office in North Sydney uh, with my uh, with my brother, and um, I'm in the car, and I say, you know what? I wouldn't mind giving that book thing a bit of a go. And so, so I'm going on a camping holiday. Um, I'm sure your your listeners are all over the world, but at Christmas it's of course the middle of summer, yeah. and so I was uh, I was up the coast of New South Wales in a national park. I'm trying to come up with the name of a bookshop over the the you know the several days before. I just wasn't happy with the names I was coming up with, and I was uh, I was in the national park, so it was a really hot Australian summer's day with the insects screaming at the top of their lungs, and <laughs> and I was uh, and I turned to the person I was with and I said to them, oh, it's like that kids' movie Ants, where the insects talk about this place called insectopia and uh, and as soon as i said that i said oh booktopia that could be a good name and of course back in 2003 we were we were still on dial-up modems i'm sure you remember the sound of a yeah of a 56 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so i couldn't just look on my phone and go i wonder if that's available i had to wait a whole week till the camping oh, trip torture. was over there. tony that's torture <laughs> to me <laughs> Run out, uh, park in front of the house, run inside, turn on the computer, to look up, you know, the website and ASIC to see whether anyone had it. No one did. All right, we bought the URLs and and the the business name, and we rang this company in in Sydney who was doing all these bookstores websites, and and we said, look, we're going to give the book thing a go too. It's called Booktopia, and sure enough, within ten minutes, they had set up a website with Booktopia's name at the top, and there was a million <laughs> books on there. And so, my brother who handled the finances. Um, from, from all of us. I was more sales and marketing, as I said before. My brother-in-law was more IT, and my, my brother did handle the finances. He said, all right, you can, you can work on Booktopia, but you've got to do it outside of hours. We're really you know, just getting back on our feet again and all this consulting work. You've got to, you've got to do it after, after work. And I said, that's sure, that's no problem. He said, and I'm giving you a budget of $10 per day to start the company. <laughs> wow, oh. that was generous of him. <laughs> <laughs> he's very he's very generous he hasn't changed in all those years <laughs> and, and uh, so fa are the family members still involved with the with booktopia yeah we're, we've been working together now for 19 years uh, okay yeah. and and just to digress a little bit sorry tony what was the name of your consulting your seo internet business um before booktopia it's called globalize globalize okay yeah it was also it was the chat software company as well, so we we just used the the same name. So we were we were still selling the chat software, but it was not a main part of our business. In fact, we gave it away for free for anyone that used, if they wanted it, who took our internet marketing uh, consulting services. So okay, so Booktopia was born from from that whole experience, and actually, I'll add. I'll add to that, not only was it born, but it was born on the 4th of February 2004, which I did not know until we celebrated our 10th birthday. And on the same day, Facebook was celebrating their 10th birthday on, uh, and we were, we were started on exactly the same day. Ah, okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. So, uh, yeah. So, so in terms of uh, book sales in Australia at the time, the the bookstores still were very strong. I mean, there was you know bookstores all over the place. There was Dimmix and the Angus and Robinson and um, Borders came in as well, and that was going quite well. Uh, I mean, in in my view, because I've got a book in front of me now, you guys can't see it, but my first ever online purchase was a book from Amazon in 1997 called The Drum Book by Jeff Nichols, and I've still got it. And uh, back then in 97, well, this is the way I'm going to be buying books from now on. None of this going into bookstores and all that sort of stuff. The only thing that actually got me into physical bookstores was somewhere like Borders that had a coffee shop in there. And really, to be honest, all I ever sort of did was get a book, have a look at it and buy a coffee. But very rarely did I buy anything because at that stage, I was getting all my books from Book Depository in the UK, which as you obviously know, is owned by Amazon now. So to me, the writing was on the wall. What was going through your mind seeing all this happen? I mean, you, you were purely selling books online, weren't you? You didn't have any physical stores. Mm -hmm. 
So what, what happened was, is because we had an SEO business and we were doing our consulting and we started on a, on a $10 a day budget, it took me three days to sell my first book. And by the end of the month, we'd done a couple of thousand dollars worth of sales. By the fourth month, I was up to 30,000 a month. And by the end of the year, 100,000 a month. And by the end of two years, 200,000 a month. So Booktopia was started with no grand plan. There was no like, we're going to be the biggest online bookstore in Australia. It was just day by day. Let's just try and sell more this month than we did the last month. And 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 so we weren't, we weren't, I guess, um, daunted by our competition. I mean, in the beginning, people said, what do, you, what do you want to start a bookstore for? You mentioned all those names before, and, you know, you're too late. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now people say to me, oh, it's lucky you got in early. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that happens. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think um, we weren't daunted by that because um, we, we never had any big plans. And as each month and each year went by and we were increasing by a significant amount, it was only after three years that we decided to do our own thing because when we had sold our re- recruitment company, we sold it to a company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. And and the due diligence process of selling that business was quite rigorous that we thought, well, we learned what, you know, what people look for and how they, how they value a business. And so, so we thought, hey, we've got a $2 million online bookstore. Maybe someone might want to buy it. Now, we knew pretty quickly, having already sold one business, that it wouldn't take people long to work out actually – Booktopia, it's just a marketing front. It's this other company that's doing all the fulfillment and managing the website. That's the real business that we want to buy. And and so because we had a background in building internet software, we decided to do our own thing. And after three years of, of building the business up, we built our own site. We moved from our little 60 square meter or 600 square foot warehouse uh, office in North Sydney to a neighboring suburb where we had 450 square meters or four and a half thousand square feet of office and warehouse. And we bought some shelves on uh, eBay. We hired a warehouse manager and we rang the publishers and we said, it's us, it's Booktopia. We're turning over 2 million a year. And they they said, never heard of you. It was all our orders were going through this other company. So, so um, we had to build basic terms and and discounts with them. We, we got, we built our business up from nothing, and over time they got to know who we were. We still did our consulting work for a couple more years up until 2009, and then Booktopia was big enough, and we moved that year to 2,000 square meters of, of warehouse and office space, uh, which is 20,000 square feet. And then a couple of years later we took another 2,000 square meters, and then in 2014 we we moved to where the Olymp- near where the Olympic Stadium is yep. in Sydney, mm-hmm. and we took 10 – 10,000 square meters, and in uh, just in the last few months, at the end of 2016, we increased that because one of our, the adjoining buildings, uh, which had a, a wall that was uh, up against our wall, another 3,000 square meters. So now we have 13,000 square meters or 130,000 square feet. So uh, look, when we go back to those early days and you ask about the competition, the strategy, all we ever did was just focus on the customer. What does the customer want? And the company that we were using in the beginning never wanted to hold stock. And so we thought by having stock might, you know, would be better. Now, when we first went out on our own, we couldn't hold any stock. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until the end of the first year where there was this one book that was really popular. Why? Because uh, the author had been on Oprah and every time they reran the show, uh, we would sell more of their books and America had sold out of its 300,000 copies and HarperCollins in Australia had 200 copies left. And I said to my brother and brother-in-law, why don't we buy all the 200 copies and then no one else will have it except us? So we did. And uh, and so our warehouse that we had, the, that first one, the 450 square meter, we had the stock where we had one stocked title. So imagine walking into a bookshop and there's only one book on the shelf. That that was our that was <laughs> our bookshop at the time. And so we um, we had uh, orders come through the website, and when people would buy this book, we would just walk over, we'd grab a copy, and we'd ship it. And for that whole of that first year of going out out on our own, leaving the other company, so our fourth year in business, all the feedback we were getting was, "You guys suck. You guys are really slow. I should have bought from Amazon." To this book, wow, what great service! You guys are really fast. And so it didn't take long for us to work out, hey, having stock gives a customer a, great, a better experience. So I said to the others, To Kill a Mockingbird is sold every single month for 50 years. Why, why are we ordering it in? We should have a few copies. Yeah, yeah. And what else? 
what else is there? How to win friends and influence people, the power of positive thinking, thinking grow rich. So we, we started to stock all these classic perennial titles, the kids books like Dr. Zeus and Harry Potter. And, and so our warehouse filled up and, and so we, everything that we did was what does the customer want? What does the customer want? And, and, and so when you think about how did we kind of emerge from the pack, it was because we were focusing on what the customer wanted in buying online. Um, and it was the new buying online was getting, yeah. there was more and more appetite for it. We have customers all over rural and regional Australia don't have access to a bookstore and then even in some of the cities where bookshops were closing down they could now buy from booktopia they could buy local we focus on a lot of australian content and and uh, and we interview a lot of the australian authors they come here and sign books in our we now have a, a recording studio and author signing room so the, all these things was was building our connections with the australian book readers and uh, look and it sounds pretty obvious and brendan and i were just talking about this before you came on the call uh what was the name of the book you've been reading brendan uh, insight selling. Insight selling, and one of the things they're talking about is giving the customer what they want uh, and being customer focused, which sounds really obvious to me because I've always come from a service background, service and sales, so uh, it, it seems obvious. But it, to stand out from the competition, it really uh, people think you have to go and do all sorts of wild and crazy things. But if you give people what they want. Uh, and look after them, then they'll they'll be advocates of your business for you know ever more. Um, and it's interesting you talk about. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the book that you were talking about that you sold was uh, deceptively delicious by Jessica Seinfeld, the one that was on Oprah Winfrey. Yep, that's yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I've experienced that myself because I was selling the DVD, The Secret, online. And then Oprah Winfrey had the people from The Secret come on. We ended up selling about $4 million worth of uh, DVDs in a three-month mm. period from that whole Oprah effect. So it's amazing to see that um, play out and how it works. But So so you've now – the, the business, business is taking off. At what year are we at now? We, we're getting into the sort of mid-2005, 2000, 2006. Is that around the time period we're talking? No, that was now 2000. And seven, two thousand and eight. So two thousand and eight okay. was when we started to really start to hold stock. Okay, okay. So from that point on, uh, what what are you seeing in the marketplace in terms of physical bookstores? So this is when they're starting to close down. The borders are starting to shut down in uh, in in America in the two thousand nine, two thousand ten, from memory. So how is it you're starting to take more advantage of the position that you're in? So so. People, well, Borders actually was end of 2011, so mm-hmm. it's a little bit later. Yeah. But um, what what um, I noticed, for example, for example, in terms of one specific genre, is that we were selling a lot of romance books, and I'm talking about the cheap romance stuff that you can get from America uh, that as the Australian bookstores didn't hold. Okay, and why didn't they, why didn't they hold it? Is because people who start a bookshop generally are passionate about books and it's something that they've always wanted to do. I'm not much of a reader. So I'm a salesman and my sales background is in solution selling. So that means focusing on what the customer wants, understanding their needs and delivering a service to them. Um, in recruitment, my brother-in-law, IBM, they were solution selling. So it's, it's a very customer-centric selling. But in bookshops, it was like, this is what we love. This is what we're passionate about. Um, and so we're not going to hold Mills and Boone or other romance titles. That was that was rubbish to them. And mm. so we, we could see that holding um, books that weren't that interesting but were still classics, uh, there's still demand, was, was just the bread and butter. Although it was boring in terms of, like, it's just units moving through your – through your facility, but at the same time, it's we didn't have to get excited about talking about it because the demand was there and people really wanted to read those books. There was a there was an appetite. So, so we started, for example, sponsoring the Australian Romance Reader Conference several years ago. Why? Because well, we were selling so much of the, of romance, it was our right or is our responsibility to to sponsor an event like that. And and so we did our philanthropic program kind of kicked off at that point where we started to look for projects and programs that we could give back and 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 focus on 
on areas. So of uh, where Australians were, were, were interested in, in books. But I, I would suggest one of the reasons why we were successful is we actually, in, and probably why Jeff Bezos was successful as well, um, not really into books, not big readers, just understand uh, consumer demand and delivering on that yeah, demand. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, establishing and, and, and identifying the, the hungry crowd and giving them what they want. I mean, it's it's what everyone talks about in sales is identifying that and this is what you're you're doing in this process. And it is... The irony is you're not a big book reader, yet you own <laughs> the biggest bookstore in Australia, online bookstore. So uh, that's, that's, it's fascinating. So, so Brendan, at this point, have you got any questions up to this point about what uh, Tony said that you want to... Yeah, I'm curious, did you get... I mean, I mean, as you said, like a lot of these bookstore owners are quite passionate about books and, and whatever. Did you get, along the way, have you had any flack or, you know, I mean, I guess that bookstores a lot of bookstores of physical bookstores have closed down over the years like have you had much friction or flack or, or or from that part of the market as the business has has grown absolutely in the beginning we did because they saw us as the enemy but we've put on our website <clears throat> and have had there for some time um that if you're a you know if you're a, an australian and you're near a bookstore, please use Booktopia for your research. But if you find what you're looking for, go into your local store, support them. They're very passionate about books and and we you know we encourage you to do that. And if you find a good one who really knows their stuff, because what happened was when I first started doing uh, Booktopia, and this is in the beginning of 2004, I was in New Zealand doing some consulting work for that company that I talked about um, earlier on that I did that first SEO project with and, and I, I was there for a week and I had time to spend outside of all of my hours and I went into the borders in Auckland to do my research and I was there over three days, <clears throat> over three days and eight hours over three days, not one person came up to me and said, can I help you, sir, or what, <laughs> wow. what are you looking for? So, so um, a good bookshop and a good bookstore, they'll, they'll always do well because they're they're – they're knowledge experts. They're passionate about what they're doing. And, and you, you, if you can walk in and talk to somebody and they know what you like and, oh, there's a great new book, new author, you never heard of them before, but I know you'll love it. And then the person goes away and spends 20 hours, 30 hours reading a book that they, they fall in love with, you've got a relationship with them. So what's happened as time's gone on is people, re- bookstores have realized we're not the enemy. Um, we're the ones that are flying the flag and, and pushing for – um, for to be an, an Australian alternative to Amazon and to their subsidiary book depository. So in the end, um, we won, I guess, in most most cases, in the majority, uh, the favour of the industry. Um, and only last month we were voted uh, the best book retailer in Australia. Fantastic. Well, well done, and that's that's a huge achievement considering relatively short space of time in the in the scheme of things. Um, looking at how you know a lot of businesses in the past, how long it's taken. Because you've just said before we got on the podcast that you were just about to hit 100 million in sales, which is a, a very very significant um, amount of money for an Australian based bookstore. Do, do you sell any books uh, to overseas people, or is it only within Australia? Um, hello. I just, I just got disconnected. So we, yeah, you just got. I, to... I'm not quite sure where you head up to there, Tony. Yeah, just re- last question for me. Yeah, I was just saying um, that uh, before we uh, got on the actual recording this call, you were saying that you'd hit, you're about to hit 100 million dollars in sales, which is a significant uh, amount of money for a, a company in Australia selling selling books. Um, is any portion of that to overseas people or is that the majority of that within Australia? Australia. We do a very small portion, less than a percent to New Zealand. We mm-hmm. offer New Zealand as the same delivery option, which is $6.95 for as many books as you want as, as the shipping fee. Okay. And, uh, and so we do, that, we do that into New Zealand as well. And, and, uh, but otherwise, it's, yeah, it's a 3.7 million Australians have bought from us. Wow, and that's the marketplace in Australia, from my understanding, uh, yearly is about two point four billion in sales for books. Um, is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so there's a that's a yeah 
that's a pretty pretty big chunk. So where where do you see things going now that companies like uh, Amazon are coming into Australia? That's from my understanding, isn't really going to affect hugely this type of uh, business because they have a very strong focus with the Kindle product, et cetera. Uh, they're more going to be getting into the physical products and electronic products. Um, so where do you see things? What are your sort of uh, predictions on how Amazon is going to affect the, 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 the current business in Australia in terms of online and physical retail? Look, they'll definitely make an impact. I think just even creating awareness around who they are and, and that they're here is going to create some excitement um, and and people will, will get their uh, Prime accounts most likely or they'll start buying from Amazon. But you've got to understand online retail in Australia is just over 7% of all retail sales, mm. whereas in North America and Europe it's – 15 to 20% of all retail sales. So um, Amazon coming to Australia would most likely um, shine a spotlight on uh, buying online, perhaps to people who have never done it before. And therefore, uh, or they may have done it before, but they've only bought their airline tickets or they've bought paid for their registration of their car or insurance or something, but they, they haven't ventured out and started to spend more. So the people who may have used it will start using it more, like you talked before, before about you know, only want to buy your books online. Yeah. Um, and and we're all starting to do that. So um, they will make their impact. What we feel in terms of Booktopia and Amazon is that when you're everything to everyone, you simply cannot be one thing to one group. It's it's impossible. Yeah. And these days, these days where 40 to 50% of um, – of an online store's customer base is actually engaging with you through your phone, which has very limited real estate to lay everything out and to navigate your way through. Um, it's not easy to um, to engage or to connect with a customer in that way. So when you're only focused on books and book-related products, then uh, it's easier to make that connection with the customers and to the point where we are, uh, have a very high focus on Australian authors, Australian content, Australian textbooks, etc. So um, we feel that in our case, we're probably going to continue to do extremely well. Um, they'll probably make a, an impact on some of the bookshops that are teetering on profitability or been losing a bit of money and mm. you take that next layer, layer off, then they can't sustain themselves. And so that be a few more bookstores going under, but, in general, um, they they will um, they will make their their splash, but they will not necessarily uh, win all of the business. And because I do a lot of overseas travel with the, with regard to my my role, I get to look at other countries and continents where Amazon exists. And there are companies over there that are doing extremely well with Amazon still around. So what we're focusing on is is that the fact that maybe Amazon will. Even if in, in Australia they took half of that um, 1.2 billion out of that 2.4 billion, mm. or even 60 percent, and they had left one billion for the rest of us, well, that's a billion dollars of, of business there available for the rest of us to have a go at. And and you got to look at you know you got to look at the 100 percent that isn't Amazon in your industries and in your markets to to realize what the opportunities are. And, and that's that's just having a positive entrepreneurial mindset. That's just going, um, I, I don't see the, I don't see the doom and gloom. I, I'm just, I, all I can hear is and see is opportunity. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think in, in terms of, you know, what you're saying in the percentage of uh, online retail um, in, in Australia, we are much lower than the average uh, position. And, I'm dealing, I've run a lot of workshops and training courses in, in Perth for people who are looking at getting started in e-commerce. So everyone's got a position and I think, you know, there's a lot of niches out there. And I look at all the time that I spend buying from different websites that are not the Amazons or the Ebays of the world. They're, they're smaller niche sites where I get, you know, specific custom-made watch straps from um, for my, um, my Apple Watch that you can't get on Amazon, you can't get anywhere else, you can only get it from this website. So, and they're, they're doing great business. And so there's lots of examples of people who are carving out their, 
their own or making their own pie, let alone taking a piece of the pie. They're making up their own pie that no one else can sort of get access to. So I think the opportunities are great. And you're seeing that as well, Brendan, with all of your clients, aren't you? Yeah, I think, I mean, Tony brought up a good point there that, uh, you know, the business fundamental of you need to be different, like you need to have something unique or some angle that differentiates you from the market. I think that's important. And it's kind of like the, I agree with, with Tony, like the rising rising tide floats all, all boats kind of thing. Mm. Um, the, the e-commerce market in Australia is quite immature to overseas. It's, you know, three to five years behind in some ways. And a lot of that's to do with logistics and the geographic kind of the spread of Australia. But I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, it's going to hurt some people because there's a lot of online stores and online retailers that don't really, they're just a me too. They don't have something unique and they're not differentiated. And also there's a, you know, you've got to be on the, the front of technology when you're doing business online. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of online stores just aren't in Australia. So I think for those, they're going to struggle because there's nothing unique. Amazon will come along and just stamp them out. Um, whereas the guys that are unique and they have something different and you know, from a business fundamental perspective, there's a reason to buy from them as opposed to Amazon. I think over time they'll probably do better as more people, as you know, the, the rising tide, more people start buying online. And you know, call it, online retail is in this funny point where it's, not, it's just become retail. It's like it, there's not online or offline. There's, you know, mm. there's both. People before walking into a store, people will Google that store. They look it up on Google Maps or, or whatever it is. So that there's this clear de- delineation between online and offline doesn't really exist anymore. And I don't think a lot of businesses have caught up or understand that. And they're not. And a lot of them aren't taking advantage of it. You know, there's a distinct advantage for some businesses that have a physical store to doing business online because you get the synergy of having both. Um, and I think in Australia, there's a lot of businesses that if they don't, they don't innovate and they don't keep on the forefront and they don't, like Tony said, like they need to be entrepreneurial and they need to be sales focused and they need to have that commerciality that a lot of businesses just lack in Australia. Um, I think that's, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see some blood in the streets from the, the kind of less commercial businesses. And then the ones that do have that differentiator are really going to benefit from kind of that increased awareness of, Hey, you can buy this stuff online and, you can get it, you know, within a couple of days as opposed to waiting to the weekend and, and going to the store or spending a whole bunch of time and, at the shopping center on the weekend or, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And Tony, you, you might find this funny. I was <laughs> funny or sad, one of, the, one of the two. I was actually at a local chamber meeting, uh, chamber of commerce, several months ago. And there was a lot of guys, typically they were older guys, I've got to say, guessing late 50s oldest uh, late 50s mid 60s something like that who was running retail stores and one of them came up to me and said almost verbatim these words what can we do about stopping this internet thing <laughs> they, were, they were his words like the internet is killing a business how, how what can we do about it and i was going well you've got to get on the train because uh you know if, if you don't join them you, you're gonna lose out so uh and do you have the same sort of feeling about that, Tony? I mean, physical retail stores now have a certain uh, place in the market, but they're, they're certainly struggling. And I, I know around where I live in Subiaco in, in Perth, uh, there's for lease signs up on a lot of buildings and it's getting more and more that way. It is hard, I think, to, to um, modify your behaviour when you've been doing something for so long um, and that you, you know, you, you you roll the dice. You think you're playing Monopoly, um, but actually it's Trivial Pursuit. And and you try and make your moves. And why isn't this working? It used to work. I used to mm. I used to do this. Used to get this result. So the game has completely changed. And and that kind of, I mean, in the publishing industry, I, I know that I've had people who have said to me, I, I'm a dinosaur. I can't. I don't know how to think. Like the new generation, all I know is how to do publishing like the old days, but it's all changing. And one of the guys that I know no longer works in the industry because it just changed too much. And the younger people had to come through because he just couldn't change his mindset. Yeah. It's an interesting. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm going to be 54 in a few weeks. So um, I, I'm, I'm also in my mid fifties almost. So some, I guess some people have, been able to see the future and and adapt and others have not um 
It's, yeah, yeah, it's, and it's, it's true. And look, you're just a young man. I, I turned fifty uh, in October, so I'm, I'm I'm catching up to you, mate. Um, but uh, it's you know we've both been in the space for a long time, and we've both adapted, and it's something that we're in, both interested in. And uh, but I do I do see a lot of people my age. They're they're forty in mid forties, fifties, and they're struggling with this whole internet thing. All right, they're. Re- anything technology based they they have a uh, a real challenge with and i think i've just taken it for granted because it's a keen interest of mine that i that i'm pursuing it and same with brendan that you really it's adapt or die isn't it and it's a it's a shame but if you really can't grasp what's happening with and the changes and they are rapid faster than anything i've ever seen in my lifetime then you know they just they they will get left behind so but um Finishing on a on a positive note, uh, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to to come on the show. And there's a lot of people who listen to this who are they're just getting started. They're wanting to have some sort of uh, online presence or a, a business, whether it's service based or product based. Uh, some tips from you, as someone who's been there and done that. Um, what would you say that they need to focus on the most getting started in an online retail business? First of all, uh, when, I mean, if a lot of people will be th- sitting there thinking uh, or walking around and looking for opportunities going, oh, my God, it, everyone's thought of everything. But the truth is, is that the Internet um, and, and in e-commerce has really only been going for 25 years now that may sound like a lot now but think about it in 25 years from now when it's when the internet's been gone for 50 years anyone that got in involved 25 years ago in 2017 people were saying oh i wish i would have been out again in 2017 it's so yeah you, you've got to you've got to change your mindset about the fact that it you've missed the opportunity. There's opportunities happening all the time. So that's the one thing. You've got to realize that right now someone's coming up with the next Facebook or the next Google or whatever it might be mm. that's going to turn somebody into a billionaire um, and and therefore there's there's tremendous opportunity. The other thing is, is that when you start a company, um, one of the things we, um, you know, I like to remind people is that is that you – you're going to make mistakes. Things will happen just the way that you can't, it can't be perfect. Oh, one thing everyone should definitely do is, is there's a website called archive.org. Yeah. It's the way back. Machine. Yeah. And if you go to, if you go to the way back machine, you can actually enter in domain names, website addresses of websites that, um, and have a look at what their website looked like at a certain time period. So if you look at the booktopia website, Put in Booktopia into the Wayback Machine at archive.org. You you can actually go to 2004 on the 7th of February 2004 because it took an HTML photograph of our website yep. on the day that we sold our first book. And you'd think to yourself, my God, how could you even be embarrassed to start your company like that and for your website to be so um, so um, um, basic? But don't get caught up in trying to make your website or be the best it can be. Like, just make sure that that you you can um, get it up there, get it out there, and it will improve over time. So, so the website that you see today of Booktopia, um, we got developed when we were turning over around fourteen million, heading towards twenty million, and I got one of the mums at my son's school and engaged her because she was a graphic designer. And my brief to her was, look, we're going to turn over 20 million this year. I said, but if someone came to our website and they never, they had never seen or heard of our business before and they come to the website and they look at it and the question you ask that person, how much, how much do you reckon they're turning over? What's their revenue? And the answer to that question has to be a hundred million dollars. That was my, that was my brief to her. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, and now we're about to hit $100 million, funnily enough. So um, it's about kind of Im- imagining what you want to be and where your customers are and focusing on what they need to then be able to be a value, be a value to to somebody somewhere 
and hopefully many people and multitudes of people because then they'll just want to hand over their cash to you. They want to get through the checkout and go and hit yes, place the order. That's yeah, that's the key. Raving um, fans. And that's that's ultimately the goal, isn't it? Raving fans or evangelists or everyone I call them, shouting your name from the rooftop and uh, customers for life if if they're looked after. So. That's that's great. Right. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, any anything else you got for Tony, Brendan, before we go? <laughs> I think we could spend hours talking. About I know this, we but... could. I know, but we're yeah, aware of Tony's time, and we've we've already gone over a little bit. So, um, uh, and look, uh, at some stage in the future, Tony, we'd love to have you back on and talk about you know what's happened over the last uh, year or two since we initially spoke. That'd be that'd be great. And uh, congratulations! It's fantastic seeing. A local business doing so well and um, navigating the whole process of the internet and online sales and you've done very 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 well so uh, thanks for your time and uh, yeah. we look forward to uh, speaking to you again and uh, buying some more books and um, yeah we'll, we'll speak again soon and congrats on your on your podcast great job Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Brendan. You've been listening to The Business Marketing Show. You can find us at businessmarketingshow.com on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher.